I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. 
we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Lord, open our lips. And our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Let us recite the Venite now together. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth and the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee, and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice.
A reading from the book of Genesis, chapter 28, verse 10. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth, the top of it reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and to your offspring. And your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, and to the north and to the south. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. He called this place Bethel. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading comes from the letter of Paul to the Romans. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is with that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if, in fact, we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing 
for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one subjected to it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have had the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we await for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from the Gospel according to Matthew. Another parable Jesus put before the crowds. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat among them, along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at the harvest time, I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. And the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where they will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. 
Let anyone with ears listen. The word of the Lord. I speak to you in the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning, and welcome back to our series on the adventures of Jacob, patriarch and scoundrel of the book of Genesis. Last week, we looked at the conflict and contrast between Jacob and his twin brother Esau in two separate yet interconnected stories. Today's reading follows immediately after as the tension between Esau and Jacob after the blessing-stealing event was so great that their mother, Rebekah, feared they'd kill each other. And so Jacob is sent off to find a wife from his mother's family rather than marry a local Canaanite. Now, this was no minor trip. Isaac and his household were staying near Beersheba in the southern end of what would later be the country of Israel. Haran was a major trading city of the Assyrian Empire and is within the borders of modern Turkey to the north. On the day we catch up with him, Jacob has come to rest for the night in a certain place. He picks up a stone and puts it at his head place, either as a pillow, ouch, or as a defensive safeguard. It's a little unclear and he dreams. Have you ever seen the 80s film The Adventures of Milo and Otis? There, Milo the cat finds safe harbor overnight in an owl's nest, warned only that it is a dreaming nest. Happy or sad, dreams will come. Well, that's what's happened here. Jacob has unknowingly stumbled on a so-called thin place, and he's about to have a divine encounter. As many of us know from Sunday school lessons at an early age, this is the story of Jacob's ladder, although it is neither Jacob's nor a ladder. He dreams of some form of path, either in visualizing the steps of a Mesopotamian tiered temple called a ziggurat, or as the graded path of ascent to a great city. On this path, divine messengers are walking back and forth, and God appears and speaks directly to Jacob. God confirms the blessing and birthright that Isaac has pronounced on Jacob, accepting the outcome regardless of Jacob's deceptions in attaining it. God promises not only offspring as numerous as the dust of the earth, but also a constant presence beyond these borders and provision for an eventual return. Jacob awakes and responds in three ways. First, he reacts in word and emotion, first exclaiming, God is here, and I didn't even know it. And then in fear, he names the place as the house of God, literally, Bet-El, and the gate of heaven. Second, he takes the stone that he had placed by his head, and he sets it up as a pillar anointed as a shrine. Archaeologists call these stele, and typical examples from this region are massive, often over 10 feet tall. While Jacob's trickster side from the last set of stories may remind some of us of the Norse Loki or Greek Odysseus. This time, he's more of a Thor or Hercules. And finally, he bargains. That's right. God has given him an open-ended promise, but Jacob makes conditions. In the verses immediately following our lectionary passage, Jacob makes a vow saying, if the Lord will be with me, keep me, and give me what I need so that I can return to my home in peace. Then 
I will have you as my god. You can have this stone as your house, and I'll give you a tithe. Once again, we can see how Jacob's deceptive nature doesn't allow him to simply trust others. His approach to the world as a constant battle for his own interests in the face of those who may take advantage of him becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Even though Bethel was still far from his destination, the story skips ahead to his arrival in Haran at a very special well. This is where the servant of his father, sent to find Isaac a wife, first met his mother, Rebecca. And in classical biblical style, it is now where G Jacob seeks a wife. As we continue into the first verses of chapter 29, the narrator carefully describes the key parts of the scene. Jacob sees first a well. Then he sees three flocks of sheep. And finally, he notices the size of the stone covering the top of the well. Now, wells like this were vital parts of the ancient nomadic economy and society, and they were closely protected from competition. A gigantic stone was placed over the top, which would, rep which would prevent a single shepherd from hoarding the water or even poisoning it for others. The implication of this setup is that the stone is too heavy for even three shepherds to lift on their own, and they were waiting for more to gather with their flocks before attempting to give water to the sheep. Jacob strikes up a conversation with the waiting herdsman, asking after his relatives and inquiring about the delay as if to emphasize the centrality of this stone. And then the narrator interrupts Jacob's speech and his heart. For lo, the jewel of Jacob's heart has arrived and everything is changed. The trouble is, this narrator, who we have seen last week, is sometimes intentionally vague in how he forces open room for interpretation and in how this story is told has done it again. The syntax of the Hebrew is slippery. Now, here it is in English. While he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she kept them. Now when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of his mother's brother Laban, and the sheep of his mother's brother Laban, Jacob went up and rolled the stone from the, mouth, the well's mouth and watered the flock of his mother's brother Laban. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and wept aloud. And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's kinsman, and that he was Rebekah's son, and she ran and told her father. It's clear that Jacob is excited. In fact, he's so pumped, he runs over to the well and single-handedly lifts away that massive boulder in a second display of superhuman strength. But there's a more subtle wordplay here by the narrator, suggesting some doubt about what exactly has caught Jacob's enthusiasm so much. First, Rachel's name literally means you, as in a female sheep. Second, Jacob's reaction is based on seeing both Rachel and the sheep. And third, the Hebrew verb for watering the sheep and kissing Rachel have the same consonants and make a perfect pun. Did he give water to the sheep and kiss Rachel? Or did he kiss the sheep and give Rachel a drink? The narrator leaves it open-ended. This is where we're ending for today's storytelling and we'll continue on next week. For today, I want to highlight two larger points, in addition to noticing these layers of humor and nuance we often miss 
in the English translation. The first is that Jacob's character remains the same as it was at home. He's still self-centered, ambitious, and driven to seek advantage in fear that he will lose in some way if he does not. When he's given a divine promise backing up his father's blessing and granting of birthright, he insists that his loyalty will be subject to proof of divine provision over time. And when he arrives at his destination in search of a wife, we're given ample suggestion that, while Rachel may be appealing, so are those sheep that he would love to take ownership of as part of the family. The second aspect of these stories that I'm reflecting on today is again on how fate, divine appointment, and choice and consequence interplay in the narrative. Remember, last time our narrator left open the idea that Jacob and his mother made their own fate in seizing the patriarchal legacy. And yet God in this story seems to honor that in spite of Jacob's sometimes somewhat unsavory character. At the same time, as we saw in contrast with Esau, Jacob's choices come with consequences. And we'll see some of those come out in negative ways next Sunday. There's some comfort in this story for me, as well as warning. It comforts me that God works with this flawed character and makes an open-ended commitment to him and a promise for a great legacy, even knowing that Jacob won't respond in kind or deserve what he's been given in ordinary human terms. But it's also clear that God leaves Jacob to suffer through the consequences of his own choices. Jake, Jacob's deceit is over and over again returned in kind, and his life is a constant self-generating struggle. It's good to know that our flaws are not barriers to God, and that God's promises both for us and for what we might contribute are not dependent on our performance. And yet God also lets us experience the consequences of our flaws. We're not going to be able to mistreat others and avoid the repercussions in our inner soul and our outer relationships. And so in reflection on these stories of Jacob, let us remember and rejoice in the unconditional promise given to us, as well as soberly reflect and repent as we consider the consequences that we'll be allowed to receive. Amen. Let us now affirm our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. 
Show us your mercy, O Lord. And grant us your salvation. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Let your people sing with joy. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world. For only in you can we live in safety. Lord, keep this nation under your care. And guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon earth. Your saving health among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten. Nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God. And sustain us with your Holy Spirit. Almighty God, the fountain of all wisdom, you know our necessities before we ask and our ignorance in asking. Have compassion on our weakness and mercifully give us those things which for our unworthiness we dare not and for our blindness we cannot ask. Through the worthiness of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Lord God, almighty and everlasting Father, you have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power, that we may not fall into sin, nor be overcome by adversity, and in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Mercifully receive our prayers, O God, that we may know your ways and follow where you lead, responding, Hear us, good Lord. For those who are seeking a spiritual home, that they may be inspired to visit our churches and to receive a deep sense of God's presence through our worship together and the hospitality we share. Let us pray. Hear us, good Lord. That we may be set free from the need to claim our worthiness through possessions and position so that we may discover our true identity in the life and hope of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Hear us, good Lord. That the light of Christ may reveal the path to those for whom the shadows are long, the poor and desperate, the lonely and unemployed, the hungry and fearful, the refugee and homeless, the prisoner and those who live as if in prison, that we may not forget them. Let us pray. Hear us, good Lord. For our Commander-in-Chief and all who serve in the armed forces, that we may be thankful for their many sacrifices and honor the service they render to our country and to the security of the world. Let us pray. Hear us, good Lord. For those who have died, that they may reside in that place where there is no sorrow or pain, but life everlasting. Let us pray. Hear us, good Lord. For safety for children who are on vacation, that they may have the chance to learn new skills, build healthy bodies, and develop new and lasting friendships. Let us pray. Hear us, good Lord. With heart and mind turned toward God, we continue our prayers. We pray for Catherine, Carol, Tom, Lynn, Colleen, Marion, Marty, Mason, Jay, Jerry, Dan, Lauren, Irene, Jeff, Kevin, Raylan, Shayla, Brenda, Chris, Mike, Alicia, Lee, Amina, Ray, Aaron, Chris, Donna, Joyce, Sydney, Elsa, Joe, Julius, and Anne. <clears throat> For all who have died in communion of your church, especially Brett and those whose faith is known to you alone, that with all the saints they may have rest in that place where there is no pain or grief, but life eternal. Let us pray. Hear us, good Lord. We also pray for Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, 
Michael, our presiding bishop, Mike, our bishop, John, our priest, and Al, our deacon. On the diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for the work of all special ministries, commissions, and committees in the Diocese of West Virginia. And in our companion diocese in Columbia, we pray for the Reverend Javier Aldana, Mission Rural El Rosa de Santa Marta. At this time, I ask you to offer any additional prayers you might have. as this virus spreads in our own community and town. We pray for protection for those who are infected, for those who are caring for the affected, and for all those around, loved ones, jobs, all the things affected in our lives. Give us the patience, kindness, and outreaching hands to help and to do what is right in this time of such distress and lack. Almighty and ever-living God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, hear our prayers for this parish family. Strengthen the faithful, arouse the careless, and restore the penitent. Grant us all things necessary for our common life and bring us all to be of one heart and mind within your holy church. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us join now in the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray 
give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth, and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. And now we recognize the birthdays of those in our parish this coming week. We celebrate Elaine, Will, and Lynn. Let us join now together in the birthday prayer. Gracious God, as we rejoice in the birthdays of these your children, we pray that the year ahead will be one of blessing and peace and that the year will bring continual joy in the knowledge of your steadfast grace and love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As for announcements this week, our schedule continues on as usual. We will be having another youth uh, group meeting coming up soon. The date is being scheduled. and uh, we We'll have that up for you soon. Um, our evening prayers continue on Wednesday evenings at 7.30, live on YouTube. We will be having a... Um, we've announced that our pandemic committee group, which is made up of many medical professionals and scientists, has uh, recommended that our parish continue to remain as it is now as far as services. Uh, being primarily online through October. We're doing this um, because we're seeing rising cases in our county now, and we're also concerned what will happen as students return to both the K through 12 and the university level of our schooling. We, the Vestry has um, accepted that recommendation, and that is what we are operating with at this point. We are also starting a new fundraising program to enhance the virtual um, live streamed capabilities of our church, as well as enhance the audio sharing of our services when we are able to come back together. As some of you have known, we've long wanted to have some hearing assist devices, and we've also been faced with issues when we have large gatherings in the audio extending into our parish hall. So in addition to the live streaming and those audio options. We want to put all those together and we're going to have a campaign to see if we can put together some money and assemble the materials needed to enhance those capabilities of our church so that we can not only meet the needs of our present time and circumstances, but continue to offer the live stream service as a permanent option for those who are shut-ins, for those who aren't able to come to a church on a specific Sunday all throughout the future as well as being able to add those audio things. So um, please take a look at the materials we're offering and see if you might be able to contribute towards these efforts of increasing the capability of our church to involve those in worship in many ways. And now, may the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing through the power of the Holy Spirit Amen.